I'm the chapter president of the Wood River Chapter of the Idaho Native Plant Society. Tonight, our presentation is Cheatgrass, History, Biology, and the Future with Dr. Ro Roger Rosentretter. Roger is a botanist, a plant ecologist, naturalist, and conservationist. He graduated in 1974 in botany and biology from the University of Montana and in 1976 with an MA in biology from Clark University, a private research university in Massachusetts. He received his PhD in botany from the University of Montana in 1984. From 1978 to 2013, and if you're good at math, that comes out to about 35 years, he worked for the Bureau, Idaho Bureau of Land Management, both statewide and regionally, and often as an educator. At BLM's Idaho State Office, he was the program manager for rare and endangered plants and for weed management and retired as the state botanist. During his BLM career and continuing into retirement, Roger has collected more than 19,000 specimens, the vast majority being lichens, which should come as no surprise to many of us, and has donated duplicates of specimens to herbaria all over the world. He is a leading expert on Idaho's rare plant species and has made a particular effort to protect the species Louisia sacagawea or Sacagawea's bitterroot, a newly identified species. This rare and beautiful Idaho native occurs nowhere else in the world but central Idaho and is the first plant species to honor Sacagawea. Roger has authored about 100 scientific publications and is an author or co-author of six botanical books. He has worked with several other agencies such as the National Park Service on cheatgrass issues in Zion National Park and with the USAID on the autoecology of the Cedars of Lebanon. From 2011 and to 2013, he was the president of the American, sorry, the American Bryological and Lichenological Society. And in 2008, he received the Idaho Weed Hall of Fame Award. So um, uh, it's, let's give uh, Roger a uh, warm virtual uh, Zoom welcome. So thank you so much, Roger. Yes, you can hit your, um, your reaction, uh, <laughs> your reaction buttons at the bottom. So, um, so, all right, I'll mute myself and thank you very much for joining us tonight. Okay, I think I, I need to hire uh, Kristen as my, my uh, front, per my PR person. <laughs> Let me see here, there we go. So uh, you heard what the talk is about and uh, I won't read it for you and I'll get right into it. So it's a little delay here. So I wanna talk about cheatgrass, which is the grass on the right here for those who aren't familiar with it. Looking at this crowd, I think most of you have pulled cheatgrass more than you care to. Uh, on the left here is our hero, uh, a native uh, Poa Secunda, Poa Sambergii, whatever you want to call the small Poa that's in the sagebrush steppe a lot. So this is what I'm going to try to cover today, kind of what what cheatgrass is, why is it a problem, some fire history, uh, other history associated with cheatgrass, uh, the backstory, which most fire people don't really take time to learn, is the genetics of cheatgrass. The ecology, like where does it grow the best? You think it grows bad in your backyard? Well, there's other places that it might be worse. Uh, and then speculate with you on what the future uh, will be and will some other plant replace it? And we'll talk about possible solutions and solutions that are uh, promoted by people. So first off, uh, it's very interesting, uh, any of these plants to learn some of the uh, 
background history. So why call it cheatgrass? Well, you know, farmers who were growing wheat, especially winter wheat, would plant the seeds of winter wheat and they would get cheated out of their, their wheat crop because cheatgrass was a contaminant or impurity in the seed. So instead of getting these nice heads of, of wheat, they'd have cheatgrass heads, which weren't good for sale or for, for their wheat crop. So the farmer was cheated. Uh, many years ago, back in BC, bef before cheatgrass, bunch grasses and shrubs with biocrusts uh, were in the understory well before cheatgrass came. You can still find places like this where you have sagebrush, forbs galore, a few grasses and biological soil crusts all over as a carpet in between. Here's a, even a historically gray sites that are rested now will form these layers, this outdoor indoor car carpeting of moss and lichens biological soil crust. And in these kind of sites, you'll have less and less cheatgrass. Historically, some of uh, our first views of the Snake River Plain, they showed sagebrush as a widely spaced plant or shrub that they could traverse through the landscape on. This is like a block print from early days of the Snake River Plain. Nowadays, it's rare to find pristine sites. This is one of such sites. Uh, this is a, a research natural area. And it, it is uh, in the Oahe Mountains. And you notice you have sagebrush. But if you can see my cursor, it's just an occasional sagebrush. They're not too dense. They're easy to walk through. The uh, blue bunch wheatgrass is this tall bunch grass, very, very tall. These small sandberg bluegrass clumps are here. So you have a tall grass, a short grass, arrow leaf balsam root, many other forbs like this legume in the foreground. And then having been to this site, it's hard to see in the photo, but it's just continuous cover in between these areas of lichens and mosses. Here's another research natural area, Jack's Creek Research Natural Area. This used to be a several thousand acres. It was up on the plateau on the uh, kind of foothills of the Oahe Mountains, or what they call the Oahe Front. Uh, it was very controversial in the early 80s, partly because, uh, of course, the Bureau of Land Management couldn't let this grass with open sagebrush, this pristine condition go to waste. So they, they had to put pipelines into here and, uh, and provide water and, and get more, more cows out there. So this area, this is about a, maybe 2,000 acres that are left that are in good condition. But again, you see the sagebrush is fairly uh, scattered. It doesn't get dense. There's lots of grass in between. So sagebrush step can be structurally diverse, like this photo. Here's your sagebrush. Here's a legume in front and a stragglers. Uh, Indian paintbrush, onion in the foreground here, probably uh, Allium acuminata, lots of bio crust in the foreground, species diverse communities. And this is what it turns into with uh, physical damage, livestock grazing, selecting for the more palatable plants. We lose all that perennial grass, the forbs, and the biological soil crusts are trampled. So this is why cheatgrass is a problem. 
it often, you drive by this site, you look out and you see a lot of sagebrush and you think everything's fine, but the, uh, the landscape is sick, it's unhealthy. So within the sagebrush step, cheatgrass has helped to cheat out the perennial grass, cheated out the forbs, cheated out the shrubs, cheated the bio crust, and therefore cheated out the wildlife. Fire comes in after this unhealthy condition and destroys the vegetation, changes the ve vegetation spatially from this sagebrush step that appears on the surface to, uh, to just cheatgrass often. So the history of cheatgrass is, is fairly simple. It's the cow, the plow, the seed, the breeding of the cheatgrass, then the burning of the cheatgrass, the loss and the cheating, which really adds up to the desert, desertification of the West. Humans love to disturb the soil and we get this culprit here, the cheatgrass. So cheatgrass is actively growing like in the fall or in the middle of winter, it'll germinate. When many of the native plants are, aren't even starting to grow yet and it outcompetes them for water and nutrients. We'll talk a little bit more about the biology of it to see why it's such a good competitor. But first, just kind of remember that so much as Southern Idaho and the whole West, some of the best soils were used broken for agriculture. Nowadays, some of the marginal habitats are being damaged by off-road vehicles. The seed on cheatgrass is really quite large and it has this long on on it. And there's little hairs on here that point downward that uh, kind of once they stick into your socks, they stay in your socks. I always thought that uh, working at the BLM, working in a lot of cheatgrass areas, they needed to give me a, a pair of socks a week to make up for all the socks I destroyed out there with cheatgrass. Sometimes I wanna just take my socks and, and burn my socks to get, there was just too much cheatgrass to pull them out. So here's what it looks like when it really gets thick. And the trick with cheatgrass is everybody might learn to know what this is, but as soon as this grass heads out, like this, it's green, then it gets kind of red on top, the seeds mature, and very soon after that, in the summer, these seeds will drop out of these, these uh, inflorescences and be on the soil, on the ground. So the seeds fall off in the early summer. Then in late summer and fall, cheap grass burns the above ground litter or humans start fires or lightning, but it burns off, but the seeds are down low and the heat of the fire doesn't really affect them because the heat, heat goes upward and uh, the seeds survive the fire. So given our historic and cultural uh, human impacts and distur disturbances, we set ourselves up for this cheatgrass cycle of, of poor range condition, poor unhealthy sagebrush step, and we get a fire cycle. Now, back in the eight, like 1920s, Pemsel did studies on cheatgrass and they thought cheatgrass, when it first got here from Europe or other parts of Asia, was gonna be a disaster. Well, it was bad, but it wasn't that bad because it was you know, uh, a small percent of the total cover. And they didn't understand a whole lot about the genetics back then. And it wasn't until the late seventies and eighties till we started having increased wildfires. And they caused significant sagebrush losses and increased 
wildlife concerns. Here's a sign, sagebrush is free, the old stinker station sign. And there's no sagebrush under the sign anymore. It's all burned off. But the real part of the story here is a genetic story. So first let's look at the history, the life history, the biology basically of cheatgrass. Most of you know it's an annual. It self-pollinates. Like maybe 99% of the seeds self-pollinate or even more than that, but not completely selfing. You, they have some sex, so they have some genetic recombination. They're also polyploid, so they can double in chromosome number. They're non-mycorrhizal. Most of the plants in the sagebrush step, like sagebrush, rabbit brush, most of our forbs, blue bunch, wheatgrass, they're mycorrhizal. They have these complex associations with different types of fungi in the soil. Cheatgrass doesn't need no association. It's just a big bully. It just grows without these sorts of germinate, these, these mycorrhizal uh, complex associations. They germinate. Uh, germination, once it's ripe in the summer, it's, it's inhibited for several months. So it won't germinate with like a late summer, summer rain. It won't germinate till it has that after ripening period in the fall, winter, or spring. Then it develops a two leaf stage and it just stays at that two leaf stage for the whole winter, the early spring. It, it puts all its energy from those two leaves into developing roots because the real battle for, for growth and competition in the sagebrush steppe and many other arid ecosystems is below ground. So it puts out these very fine roots and it gets the roots out into the soil before the natives have even started turning on or what you might call phenology. They, they're not even active yet and cheatgrass is, is storing up all this water so cheatgrass fills the void in between all the sagebrush. So from the road, if you don't get out of your, your vehicle, you look or you stand there, this might look like a great Wyoming sagebrush site, but it's it's in unhealthy condition. There are no, there's no plant diversity. So cheatgrass becomes this winter annual, up to 17,000 seeds per square meter. The seeds can stay viable for five to 11 years and it can germinate in the fall or spring. Throughout my talk, I'll have little brackets of references for the, uh, for the hardcore types that wanna know where's some of this data or you wanna learn more about cheatgrass germination. This would be the article to look up and I'll have these sprinkled through my talk. So, Let's look at cheatgrass production from year to year. In 1990, we had quite a drought, seven year drought almost. Uh, this was in the middle of it, but here's, there, there's a spot out in the Birds of Prey area where they measured the production of cheatgrass. There's some cheatgrass out there, but it's almost bare ground. Then five years later, we've got good moisture and then it looks all green with cheatgrass. But the whole idea is it's variable. Having variable biomass isn't good for anyone's bottom line. It's not good for someone who wants to graze the grass, someone who wants wildlife to live there, uh, someone who wants good erosion control. It doesn't provide ecosystem functions. So let's look at back into the genetics of cheatgrass. The origin is Eastern Europe, Western Asia, introduced several times as an impurity in wheat seeds. It started in the 1890s. These diverse introductions were genetically different. So it's the same species, but genetically diverse. That's Novak and Mac, 
Steve Novak's a professor at Boise State. Mac is up at Pullman. So where did where do you think cheatgrass came from? We have this as a poll. Uh, maybe, uh, Kristen, how do they do the poll? Is that at the bottom, I think? It is, um, yeah. but for some reason or other, it's telling me that I'm logged in from another device. So we do not have a poll, Roger. I am sorry. Okay. So everyone take a write it down and decide where you think it came from. Hey, Roger. I'll, I'll tell you the answer in the next slide. Yes. Do you have the poll feature on your side? I I looked in the bottom. I do not see it. Okay. There's more. Let me see if I have more. So let's let's just go with that for now. Everyone think about it. And then here's the details. This is from Herbarium Records, Collection History of Bromus Tectorum in North America from Mac in 1981, he published these things. So it's very easy to look up. Uh, the grass was first collected at Spencer's Bridge, British Columbia in 1889. Oh, there we go. Where'd that come from? So you can- I, I launched it. I don't know how, but I did it. <laughs> okay, thank you, Lisa. That's so go ahead I, and I don't before see. I give it all away. Because I'm not really telling you where it's from, so I'm telling you kind of where it's been introduced. So I'll do that and submit. So mark one of those choices and push submit at the bottom. So it's really not that critical that you know where these were, but like in Boise, it was 1899, almost 10 years after it was introduced before it showed up in Boise. And it didn't get here from British Columbia. It was a separate introduction. People bought winter wheat grain from Asia and Europe and then planted it and introduced it accidentally. Now, in 2018, Steve Novak and Actually, Lynn Kinter, who gave you the, this chapter, their last talk on orchids, Lynn Kinter did some of this work in actually sampling and the genetics of this and went over to Europe and uh, Asia and collected so she could tie which of these collections came from what part of Asia. And basically what this is telling you is you know, the different colors are different genetics and how they're mixing and where they're coming from. And if you understand that, uh, I guess I, I might just mention that in the 70s and 80s, when all these separate collections that came across from Asia and Europe as people moved around the West, they started moving these slightly different genetic types. And we ended up with basically both a hybrid cheatgrass and the cheatgrass itself, once it is hybridized, uh, evolved in place and adapted to the local climate. And how did it get moved around? Well, one of the biggest uh, kind of sad facts of life is that we like to do fire trucks from all over the place. They come to town and they're heroes. And unfortunately with grasslands, they drive around on the grassland. They get cheat grass up in their tires. And until recently, they never stopped to think about transporting cheat grass from Seattle, Spokane, whatever from places down to a different location. And so this, may, I think, is one of the major reasons for transport because these fire trucks drive across the landscape rather than just drive down the roads. They also, once it's in an area, even if it's near the road, these off-highway vehicles 
and hay for livestock gets moved around. This is one reason in Idaho, uh, we have a uh, weed-free hay rule for most of Idaho BLM, but BLM as a state uh, nationally doesn't even have weed-free hay as a policy. Uh, when I was working, I always fought for that and it never happened. The Washington office didn't want to do it. So I, we did a, had to do our own environmental impact statement just for Idaho to have weed-free hay. And uh, that, that took a, gave me a few gray hairs, I think. Anyhow, this is how we got hybrid cheatgrass in the 80s. Genetic mixing, evolving for local soil conditions, evolving for local weather condi conditions, just basic natural selection over time. So the cheatgrass in the 80s really took off. It was, it, it had come to its, its comfort zone and really became more of a problem than it did in the tw 20s and 30s. So it took about 80 years for cheatgrass to change. Right now, we're waiting for many other exotic plants to change. Buffalo grass in the southeast, southwest has, has uh, took about 100 years to change, and now it's a weed causing fires in saguaro cactus and parts of the Sonoran, all the way down to the tip of Baja, Mexico. But these exotic plants, non-native plants, will change like this and take over. So this is really, I think, the general public can understand this better now after COVID-19. You get hybrid cheatgrass by uh, global dispersal. You get hybrid insects. So many of our forest health issues now, some of our uh, common insects in the forest are the same species that they have in Russia. And yet they, aren't, they weren't so bad if 40 years ago. But when we, when we had the kind of the uh, wood crisis and again in the, uh, oh, more in the 90s with the spotted owl wars or so, the country allowed wood from Russia to be shipped over here with the bark on it, full of insects. And that's how we got diversification in many of our forest insects. Well, with weeds, it goes back a long time. Uh, but it's basically re related to dispersal. So if you go to Northern Idaho from Ketchum, clean, clean your socks. If you can't clean them, just burn them. And don't introduce cheatgrass to new places. Uh, and it's really, you know, the, the new weeds are just making a whole new kind of novel ecosystem, reweaving the web of life. Uh, for plants, it goes back to the Plant Quarantine Act in uh, 1912. And that was really in the late 1800s when chestnut blight was brought to the country uh, from Europe and wiped out our chestnut trees in the East Coast. That was a major setback, a major conversion of, of the forest from this highly productive wildlife species that had great insects on the trees, produced these big fruits for wildlife, to uh, other tree species, which were less palatable to wildlife, like tulip trees. And its fruit was not productive for most invertebra uh, vertebrates and invertebrates. So I want to jump a little bit to the solutions. And of course, you know, solutions to this ecological dilemma are proper management of native rangelands to ensure that cheatgrass does not increase uh, is the highest priority. 
you go to salmon idaho uh there's there's a lot of folks and there're probably some in the in the wood river valley who work who realize that cheat grass is looking looking to come there it gets along the roads but doesn't get out in the rangelands that are well managed and salmon idaho really they they've really tried not to do a lot of damage and increase cheat grass the rest of the state is much of the rest of the rangelands in the state are highly degraded but you want to limit dispersal of soil and plants. You want to limit soil surface disturbance. So, and you want to, in these disturbed areas, you got to reestablish a diverse plant community. That means each plant group, shrubs, grasses, forbs, biocrust. So often we just reestablish grasses after fires. We have to think about the whole growing season, the phenology. You want some biological activity occurring year round. You want to think about the structure, the physical structure of the, the sagebrush step. And once you put back in some of these things, you need to rest the sites until plants are established and reproducing. Currently, uh, the agencies rest sites. They put two two million dollars into uh, uh, a fire rehab. They rested for two growing seasons, which is only one and a half years, and in an arid system, that's not enough. They got to wait till the things they put back in are reproducing again. So this is kind of symbolizes our bunch grasses, and there's our bio crust or moss carpet right there. So that's what you need to get back in. So I want to ask you and see if this polling takes place. Uh, Lisa, see if you can do what you did before. What do you think will replace cheatgrass? Then I'll go ahead and talk about vegetation changes and solutions and how it will affect you and society. So this is kind of the future. Can uh, can you do that poll again? You should. It should be poll number two. We'll wait just a second here. What will replace cheatgrass? Formulate an idea. What do you think? Like what? What plant will come in? What will be our savior? Any suggestion is 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 uh, worth trying. I don't see our poll happening, so just write it down and make a middle note of it. I can't make it go to question number two. Sorry. Okay, <laughs> we'll we'll skip it. They they don't like to take tests anyhow. <laughs> so let's look a little quick. This is out in Birds of Prey area along uh, some old train tracks and the train actually makes a, a, a good buffer for uh, a fire break or what have you, you know, uh, and you have some good habitat here. Then we get fire after the disturbance, we get the variable cheatgrass, not economically stable. Then these are what things are coming in. This is in uh, Hell's Canyon. Uh, I'll let you, most of you know, this is yellow star thistle. Uh, you don't have yellow star thistle in the Wood River Valley, which is good because yellow star thistle is poisonous to horses. Horses will eat thistles, as you know. And so this is, it's really a, a, a bad plant to come in, but uh, this was brought in, uh, into the Hell's Canyon accidentally and has taken over Hell's Canyon. And while we're at it, we're going to talk about some of the annual plants that happen every year that come in like cheatgrass. And that's why you have to think that something's going to replace cheatgrass. 
because with annuals, you roll the dice every year. What will grow this year? What will grow next year? Will it be Medusa head or will it be cheatgrass? This is Hell's Canyon. All that yellow is a uh, flowering uh, yellow star thistle. And plants replacing cheatgrass, I'll just go over a few of them, but many of you know these. Medusa head, wild ryegrass. It's coarse, it's not palatable, it forms a mat, doesn't decompose. Again, exotic plants don't decompose like native plants because insects aren't accustomed to them. It takes thousands of years for an insect to evolve and the invertebrates in the soil don't know what to do with exotics. So they, they just don't decompose as much. You may have noticed that, that the, the many of our weedy plants just sit there and form fine fuels. And so every year we get more and more fire hazards. Jointed goat grass is another one. It's even less palatable. Most of these are not palatable. You know, at least cheatgrass has, is palatable when it's green. So ripgut brome, it, it's, it damages grazers in their gut. They bleed. When a rancher finds that they've been eating it, mostly this is more of a problem in California grasslands. They, they notice blood in the, in coming from the mouth. They know it's been grazing in ripgut brome. They take it to market, they sell the cow and get rid of it. So it's, it's really bad. Let's look at these quickly. Jointed goat grass. Uh, uncommon years ago, I remember showing uh, Gene Finley over in Vail, Oregon, uh, jointed goat grass for the first time. Uh, in the Boise foothills, we didn't have jointed goat grass. I'm going to talk a little bit about targeted grazing later. And we had uh, brought goats from uh, California into the Boise foothills and paid them to introduce this grass. And now it's uh, quite common in the Boise foothills. So here's, here's a little scenario on it. This is up Warm Springs Mesa. Here's a fence line. You see the fence pole. Here on this side of the grass, the, the fencers, you know, tall grass. And here's all the goats. And they're eating cheek grass. They're eating everything. They ate the bitter brush quite pro, uh, prolifically. Now this is, uh, let me see if I, this hit rocky outcrop, this picture's from the side or, you know, from the west. This next shot is actually from the uh, uphill side over here. And you see that same outcrop with the hackberry trees growing in the rocks. The, she, the goats did not eat the yarrow, so it's still doing okay. This is a rabbit brush. It resprouted pretty well, but this is all cheatgrass. So there wasn't that much cheatgrass. Uh, if you compare it to the other side of the fence, which was similar. But a few years after the goats, the cheatgrass is about anywhere from twice to 10 times as dense as it was before that. So what happened? You know, targeted grazing can work, but you got to do it the proper season of use. The first year the goats grazed in April, like you know, very soon in Boise, while cheatgrass was green and it was an effective tool. That for several, four more years, they brought the, the goats in, but they grazed them in June and July. Uh, by mid-May some years, cheatgrass is headed out like that. And the goats trample it, but they don't eat it because it's all brown. And so it made it worse. And why did they do that? Because the grazers, the guys with the goats were getting paid to stay in California and other places longer. And the city of Boise that 
hired the grazing and ran it, they didn't really know any better. So they allowed these goats to come in and they were very popular. They're cute, I agree. They're nice, everybody likes animals, but they were grazing at the wrong time of year and they just made it a lot worse. They uh, hit the bitter brush really hard. They uh, trampled a lot. And it was merely a diversion. It wasn't really an effective tool. Uh, another grass that's starting to come in, and again, right near this, uh, that picture where the goats were, is rip gut brome. And this is what'll happen if you don't take your cattle off when you have rip gut brome. Another grass that's very common in that same area where the picture of the goats are, which is rat tail fescue. And th this, this comes in often, you have to be very careful. If you get sheep fescue or Idaho, any fescue grass seed can have rat tail fescue as an impurity. You wanna get seed that's growing in high elevations like Wyoming. You don't wanna get grass seed from California. It might be a little cheaper or something, but this is what you get. Now, in the Boise foothills, rat tail fescue is common as heck. I took this photo right along the Boise greenbelt against the wall. You see the uh, paint peeling a little bit. But this way you get to see what the, what the head looks like on rat tail fescue, uh, Festuca myosiris. Then there's feral ryegrass, another one that's very common in Boise. Uh, it was used by both the Forest Service and the city of Boise. They planted feral rye for you know, uh, 20 plus years on purpose. They, it was used by the Forest Service higher elevations post fire. And it worked pretty well at those higher precip zones because it would give quick cover after a fire, but would then be, uh, the plants at high elevations recover better after a fire and it would be uh, crowded out. But in Boise with only 11 inches of precip, the warmer temperatures it takes over. So uh, the tall grass shades out and kills the native plants uh, and it burns readily, but not as bad as cheek grass. Then, Probably the worst grass is Ventanata grass. This first came in around uh, Moscow, Idaho, and Pullman. And Ventanata grass is a uh, very inconspicuous, hairy kind of grass, very flammable, but mostly it is totally unpalatable. And this is in the Boise foothills now too, at a little bit higher elevation and in the drainages and is replacing cheat grass. So there's the seed heads on it. You can see, and it just, even the stalks on this have little barbs that make it unpalatable to livestock. And then of course, in the really harsh sites and birds of prey, uh, pretty much totally covered with burr buttercup now. We don't have uh, cheat grass that much where the burr buttercup Burr buttercup is flowering and in its peak of glory in Boise in March. So weeds are replacing the annual cheatgrass and will be more difficult to control and are poor for livestock production. So now after introduction, which weed do you think will replace cheatgrass? Uh, you can put it in the chat since, since we are our poll isn't working. Go ahead and everybody put which of those weeds or other plants you think of, or maybe you're a real optimist and you think that Ido fescue is just going to come back with a vengeance like a superhero with a cape on and take over cheatgrass. So go ahead and put that in your in what you think will replace cheatgrass in your area. So, uh, I just want to talk a little more ecology about cheatgrass, what it really does in the whole ecosystem. It really modifies that ecosystem attributes. 
the soil temperature, the soil water distribution are affected, creating warmer, drier conditions. Fewer, you know, the, the change, changes in the future will be fewer forbs, fewer shrubs, less wildlife, warmer, drier soils, lower water infiltration rates, less water holding capacity within the soils because cheatgrass kind of takes all the organic matter out. Cheatgrass is like the opposite of an organic uh, gardener. A garden, you always put organic matter back in. De uh, you, you put compost in, but cheatgrass pulls every bit of, of nutrient out of the soil and makes it less water holding capacity. Lower ionic exchange, block your soil aggregates. And that all adds up to being desertification. So, you know, it's, it's not somewhere else. It's right here in Southern Idaho. It's becoming a desert. Uh, and you should remember it's the gap between the shrubs and the perennial plants that determines the future of the landscape. Loss of bio crust in the gaps created a leaky ecosystem it wasn't long before the threshold was passed and the system started falling apart. Here you see this has been plowed to revegetate, but it didn't, the, the, whatever they planted did not take. Maybe there's a few little things. I think those are probably little rabbit brushes. That's all cheatgrass for as far as you can see. So what are some of the possible solutions. Obviously, rest from all disturbances, rest from grazing or at least heavy grazing, or modifying grazing, managing for diverse vegetation, for biological soil crusts, targeted grazing done properly, and winter grazing, fuel breaks, herbicide applications, restoration, and rest. Those are things that are being proposed. Let's look at them a little bit and if they're realistic. So here's a, a little cartoon showing something that's not realistic. You know, Bob isn't going to jump. The tortoise isn't going to jump through a flaming hoop. It's not a realistic solution. Targeted grazing uh, with goats done at the right time of year can work. Uh, you need small pastures, you need a lot of water, you know, to feed for the goats, you need good controls. Sheep can be an effective targeted grazing, but cows are not good at targeted grazing. They just are the wrong animal. They don't herd like this, you can't move them, but you need uh, small pasture sizes for this. Fuel management with grazing and the large scale. In the short term, you, you look out there and it seems logical. You have less fuel post grazing. But the following year, there's an increase in less desirable plants because you're going to eat the more desirable plants. So you're going to have more cheat grass the following year. It'll become thicker cheatgrass stand and become more flammable over time. So you have fewer desirable plants. So unless it's done effectively in small pastures, uh, fuel management or grazing is really just a diversion. It's just kind of a, you know, like, look here, don't worry about the real issues. We're going to do this. So because grazing slowly converts these clumpy bunch grasses, and biocrust to a continuous annual grassland like this. So here, if you get a fire, you get fire breaks naturally. And, and even when you have wet years, no matter what you do, you're gonna have an increase in cheat grass unless you have shallow rooted perennials and biocrust or, or desert, desert rock pavement to occupy that upper soil profile. So keep cheatgrass out by seeding shallow rutted grasses like sandbird bluegrass and other bluegrasses or fescues 
and managed to encourage biological soil crust. The loss of these crusts causes ecological cascades through the system with a loss of soil stability and ecosystem function. Here's our degraded cheatgrass pasture again. So here's our possible solutions, just to recap. And uh, remember that, you know, like grazing management, it's, it's uh, there are things you can do. I wanted to run through these results of uh, a study by Root and all recently. They show that the more soil, biological soil crust and the rich species richness had much less exotic annual grasses. In fact, what's interesting is low levels of grazing were, you know, fine. Medium level of grazing, this is the amount of cheat grass. It's, it looks great. It's only these high levels of grazing, uh, like that cause the cheat grass. Here's a sad photo of cheat grass down near the Snake River Plain. Uh, Snake River itself uh, at a stage right when it's all turning red. So I don't know if you've seen photos like this. It's only like this for a few days, then it'll go brown. But this is the stage. It's almost all cheatgrass, a little riparian veg in an ephem ephemeral riparian area. And this is a structural equation model indicating that grazing did not directly promote exotic annuals, but rather reduced the soil crust cover and richness, which favored the annual grasses. So these results showed certain groups of lichens and short mosses were the best at keeping out uh, the annual grasses, partly because that big seed gets stuck up above them. Uh, this is the same, this kind of landscape level study uh, coincides with the study suggesting that biotic soil crust can modify germination and establishment rates. This is kind of a, you know, the Reader's Digest version of that. These large seeds here on bare soil, they'll all germinate. Here on top of mosses, they won't germinate. So, and then fuel breaks sounds great, but they often become weed and cheatgrass corridors and facilitate cheatgrass. Uh, when they do these long roads, they often become corridors for those little ATVs and off-highway vehicles, which just spread cheatgrass. And really making fuel breaks, there's different ways of doing it, but just plowing up the, the sagebrush step and then trying to plant something doesn't work in our arid systems. Here's an example of long the freeway. You'd think this is 10 miles out of town from, uh, 10 miles from the Oregon border. But here you see it's just a, a, a weed patch of cheatgrass and that was their fuel break. So exotic grasses are also slow to decompose. I talked about that a little bit earlier because insects start the decomposition rate and exotic grasses can add fuels for several years. And uh, polyploid plants have thicker cell walls. That's why horticulturists like them. The thick walls, they have fewer pests, they flowers stay around longer, but they're terrible because insects don't eat them and then they don't decompose. So what can you do? You can clean, clean your clothes, your boots, you, uh, clean camping equipment, cleaning off soil equipment. Don't transport soil, firewood, or plants to new areas. If not, the future will be just like much of our uh, areas now with cheatgrass in Southern Idaho will look like the deserts of the Middle East. So I hope you have a little greater appreciation for how cheatgrass is integral to degrading the land for farmers, ranchers, wildlife, and ecological functions currently and into the future. 
So I hope you'll help me uh, stop cheatgrass and reverse the trend with some of our suggestions. And hopefully some of you will help uh, promote good stewardship. With that, I'll uh, take some questions. Well, thank you so much, Roger. Um, that was a fascinating talk. Um, I am curious about the poll results, or at least the answers to those poll questions. Um, so where does cheatgrass, where did it originate from? Well, it, it came from all those different places. It came uh, from all over Europe and Western Asia, Eastern Asia, Central Asia. They're all separate introduction. Each one of those listed by Mac were separate genetic composition. Like I said, the neat thing about our Native Plant Society here is that Lynn Kinter actually did a lot of that field work in conjunction with uh, Steve Novak. Uh, she went to Europe, uh, Michael Mancusos went with on some one of the collecting trips and they went around Europe collected and sampled genetically, you know, they grabbed the sample, somebody else in a laboratory sampled the, uh, to see what it lined up with. And then they were able to, to see where that cheatgrass that was introduced, say from Boise to Boise, Idaho, where it came from. I don't, I'd have to look it up in that article. Uh, and it might not be that straightforward, but, uh, for example, Lynn might have helped figure that out. So that's kind of neat that we have uh, a, a lot of, you know, the, that sort of researchers right here in Boise and Idaho in the broad sense, you know, Moscow, Pullman area. Um, and then we have a, it was an early question about polyploidy increasing, uh, how does polyploidy increase cheatgrass fitness? And you talked about the, the thicker um, cell walls, was it? Yeah, well, you know, in horticulture, mm -hmm. in horticulture, they're always uh, trying to cross plants and, and polyploids are very popular because they get thicker cell walls. They're often a polyploid is bigger, taller than, than, uh, than uh, diploid. And so the same thing kind of happens at a cellular level. And in ornamental type plants, you know, most of the plants we plant in our yards are horrible for, for biodiversity. They contribute very little to the ecosystem. They don't have insects on them. They have thick cell walls for the leaves, for the stems, for the flowers. Uh, doubled flowers have no nectar for pollinators. I mean, we do almost everything possible in our horticultural realm to keep these, these things around us that might look pretty, but don't don't really function, don't really interact with, with the things that most of us care about, which are things like insects. And insects are the, you know, like the dollar bills of nature. They pass energy from one trophic level to another. So they're, you know, 96% of songbirds need insects to feed their young to raise their broods. Without those insects in our yards, you don't have have a you know in have baby birds. You know they don't live, they don't survive. And uh, once you get more and more of these, like you know, you can find them all over the country. Gated community with with you know domestic uh, exotic plants planted all over and sterile lawns and you know. It's it's a uh, it's a crisis, you know, a landscape crisis, and so you know, I want to have shrubs that have holes eaten in the leaves and have caterpillars and insects and butterflies and stuff, you know. But those you want to stick with the diploids. Great. Um, someone else asked, how do you reestablish bio crust? Uh, stability, 
sometimes people, you know, compact the soil a little bit or, you know, make it firm. You know, like if you do a seeding, you might, uh, uh, like planting grass seed, sometimes people will roll it, you know, and that encourages some bio crust on the surface, but mostly just not disturbing it, you know. We're so uh, big on turning soil over and messing it up, you know. Uh, No-till farming is much better for the for everything, including our gardens and our spaces and our rangeland. So I thought I remembered way back in the day um, something about taking lichens, pulverizing them, putting them in some sort of a solution, and spraying them on the soil or on rocks. It was that just a, a archaic memory, of was, it, or was that a really a technique? No, that that was true, and it was probably buttermilk they used to use, and uh, that would be putting on rocks or fences and stuff, and you'd get lichens growing on fences. Idaho is pretty arid, so it didn't work so well, but in Europe or England where it rains a lot, that's a common practice, mm -hmm. but here it's, uh, it, you know, if you just like uh, make a stable community, they tend to come. And there's a lot more detailed work on that, you know, that I could reference. There's a, a recent article in uh, Restoration Ecology. The whole issue is devoted to soil crust mm -hmm. and uh, tell you which species are, are early colonizers, that sort of thing. And in general, if you want to prevent cheatgrass, it's those short mosses that are really good. And those are pretty easy to, to encourage. Just by leaving disturbed just, soil alone? Yeah, and, and soil, you know, like, you know the, how the soil is. If you walk in the soil slowly, uh, when it's moist, you do almost no damage. Mm -hmm. If you are running or if you're, you know, you run a mountain bike or a motorcycle across something with sheer force, you disrupt the soil. Uh, you drive on it, you tend to disrupt it, you, you know. So uh, you, you want to disrupt it, try not to disrupt it and drive on it or do, do mechanical damage when it's moist and pliable. Once it dries up, it's like talcum powder and it just breaks up and you, you destroy the crust. So it's somewhat, again, the season, the season of use, you know. Um, we have another question about a green fire break program that happened on BLM lands, probably in the 1980s. Um, a gentleman named Mike, uh, I believe it's a plant, pellant, pellant, uh, worked on it. Do you know what what the long term consequence of that was? Yeah, I was. I think we started that in 1985 or 86. I was on those original committees, and you know we were very gung ho. We were naive. And uh, the concept's great if it would work, but you know, the reality is that some like 20% of their seedings on BLM are, are successful, which is a real low percent. So you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna end up with, and what I showed in the one photo, that line of cheat grass that was green all over Hawaii County and around Boise, you can see these you know, some people call them weed corridors or brown strips or whatever, but they, the, the goal was to make, call them green strips, but they, they never really worked. And uh, there are a few that, that took, you know, that 20%. And some of those are mostly, uh, uh, there, there's a few places that they do work, I guess, but uh, they, like any agency, they don't have a mechanism where you can go back in and try a second time or a third time or, you know what I mean? You get one time funding and if it happens to be a dry year, you know, sorry, Charlie. And then we have a weed patch. So there's other ways to do it. You know, some of the mowing they're doing, I think can, can be helpful, but not, uh, I, I haven't seen a fuel break yet that, that's done much. 
Thank you. Um, someone asked just a quick question about is feral rye, the, is the species name of that um, lolium? No, it's L -O -L -I -U -M. not. It's Cicali, Montana. Some people okay. call Thank it cereal you. rye grass. Uh, mm -hmm. But a lot of people nowadays tend to use the term feral rye. But it's quite common in Boise. Uh, and it's it's almost uh, chest high, you know, grows four or five feet tall, and it's, it's. I didn't have much time to talk about, it, but it's worse than cheatgrass in some ways because cheatgrass can grow next to like some legumes like Mulford's milk vetch or something, and it's not great for it next to it, but it survives for you know 20 years like that. But then cereal rye comes in. A uh, feral rye comes in and it's five feet tall. And then when it lays down, it lays on top of and mulches and destroys the uh, milk vetches and other forbs around it. So it just becomes a monoculture of feral rye. Um, we have a question. Um, whatever happened to, I, I'm not. I'm not sure if I'm reading this right, but whatever happened to Ann Kennedy's research on biological control? Yeah, that was the, like the black fingers of death, and uh, it, it's a. It's really a kind of a smut, and or and then there's another one, a rust that gets in the seed head, the cheek grass, and in fact, you can watch for the rust. It's, they're common, they run all over, but they're so specific. They will grow in a patch, maybe uh, 100 feet across, but not interact with the genetically different cheatgrass, you know, beyond that 100 feet. So they're still working on that. They're pouring money into that, but, you know, and they've been doing that for 20 years. And it's another one of these, I guess I like to call them a diversion, you know, uh, they rather than really going after the root of the problem, you know, like treating the cold and trying to decrease dispersal of cheat grass or uh, overgrazing disturbance, you know, instead of changing the season of use for those cows to a different time, they just keep avoiding it and trying to, uh, you know, string you along with this new technology that never really has matured since those early days. You know, I think, uh, unfortunately, I see, having worked in some of the research angle of BLM, I see researchers just getting money for the sake of research. OK. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and if you see smut on your cheatgrass, like when I'm with people uh, locally, I volunteer a lot at different places. And, and you see that black uh, smut on the heads of cheatgrass, mm -hmm. you, instead of throwing that, you know, weeding it up and throwing it in the trash can, you, that's the cheatgrass you want to leave around and let it spread. <laughs> let that rust, you know, that smut get on to other things. You know, and and uh, it's not an irrigate, but it's another type of black smut, powdery smut. So there are, you know, it would be considered a biocontrol on cheatgrass. So someone asked a question: um, Have you seen a successful use of herbicide? Does it require a certain set of conditions to be successful? For example, sufficient desirable seed sources nearby? I, I guess I was most interested in this talk at the broad scale, you know, statewide, region-wide, but for your backyard, uh, you can be very successful with uh, contact herbicide like Roundup, uh, other, you know, glycophosphates, other uh, inhibitors of germination. If you have a perennial, you get a halfway established perennial grass and put on a, a, a preen type herbicide that affects germinating seeds, that will work. But I actually, 
you know, like a burn torch really works well in the early season. You can control that. And I'd recommend that for a lot of homeowners. You can go out this time of year in Wood River Valley or so. It's cold enough. It's wet. You learn when the right time is and you can use your burn torch and kill the cheatgrass with the burn torch and get rid of litter. Uh, cheatgrass likes litter. So that's, you know, mowing first and then then uh, hitting a burn torch works pretty well. But if you mow, yeah, on your own yard, you might want to mow when it's in that red red stage or sometimes people call that the purple purple headed stage when it's first starting mature. If you cut the cheatgrass before it gets to that purple stage, it'll just overcompensate and actually produce more seeds than, than it would earlier. That's why uh, targeted grazing is very difficult with it because you can come in quickly and hit an area with, you know, like a herd of goats. And then if you just take them off, then the cheatgrass, it, it, it'll overcompensate and actually produce more seed than if you had just left it. So it's, and you know, there was a period of time years ago when I thought I'd studied cheatgrass and I'd solved the problem, you know, and the more I did that, it was very depressing. The more I studied it, the more uh, uh, respect and dread I had. Cheatgrass is really tough. It, uh, it's hard to control. So, Rhonda, you were talking a little bit about um, things we could do in our yard, which was actually going to be my next question. Um, but somebody asks, what you, you talked a little bit about how we can um, uh, address uh, removal of cheatgrass or um, kind of mitigation in a certain way. But what kind of things can we plant to help return an area, let's say a person's got a, an acre and, or two and some of it's natural. Um, what would you recommend? Well, you know, one of the things is every site is so different, it's hard to give a, a blanket thing. But, you know, if you're starting with a cheatgrass area, you can, you can solarize it to kill it. You can you know, and kill the seeds, You, but you're going to have to have it dormant for a year, you know. You can smother it with your neighbor's leaves, you know. I've done that in, in some of our, our old house, I had, we had like two acres, and I, I would go out in the fall of the year and borrow friends' pickups and collect three to four hundred bags, those big paper bags of, of leaves, and I'd dump them out on top of cheatgrass areas in the yard that was an old pasture and suffocate it and just let the worms and insects kill it all. And then in about two years, you could plant right into it. Mm. And, uh, you know, it kind of depends what, what you want it to be. If you just want to like a sagebrush step, then you could start planting into it shrubs. Mm -hmm. but it's really hard to do from seed. Okay. Um, and then um, two last questions or a question and a comment. Um, under the current grazing strategies, do you think there is any chance of reestablishing soil crust in Idaho? Yeah, I think if, if somebody wants to explore that, that, that one article it mentioned, that root and alt, 2019 that was in ecological applications is a good example of that they went out in the birds of prey area and looked at you know 24 sites and these areas are currently under the this huge grazing pasture but they don't get much grazing for various reasons partly because of the drift fencing of the uh, army national guard they put up this big perimeter fence and then the cattle don't really, you know, graze there and they, they have to have haul water so they don't have water near there. So if you sample near where they're not uh, watering, crusts are coming back covering 
anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of the ground cover. But again, you guys, the Wood River Valley is getting up at a higher elevation where biological soil uh, crusts aren't as uh, thick or abundant or as needed because you have so many plants. You know, at around four or 5,000 feet elevation in Idaho, you get fewer biological soil crust. You, you know, rely on these shallow rooted uh, forbs, grasses, if you want to keep cheat grass out. You know, have a good, you know, like sheep fescue, Idaho fescue, uh, sandbird bluegrass, Lieberg's bluegrass, some of those, even, you know, Sherman big bluegrass, some of, some of those, those things can keep cheat grass out. So just to point out to people, um, uh, T.R. Boland put a link for, I guess it's the Ecological Society of America's journal link, um, which might be useful if you want to jot that down. Um, and then our last question for the evening um, for you, Roger, and thank you very much for your time. Um, is the seed, I'm oh, sorry, is the native seed bank depleted to a point that heavy seeding of native species could assist in the restoration of a diverse sagebrush steppe ecosystem? Yeah, uh, the short answer to that is yes. It's, it's, it's uh, the seed banks depleted. If you think about it, we have a grazing system where it's every year. So most of our palatable good plants never get a chance to go to seed. There's our, you know, out of the thousands of allotments in Idaho, there's there's private people and there's maybe, I don't know, 10 or 12 uh, rest rotation allotments where they rest the pasture every and only graze every other year. And they do that to let the native seed, native plants go to seed and then plant the seed the next year. So, they're really, it's, it's pretty hard to find good seed. Mm -hmm. okay. All right, well, thanks. Uh, thank you everyone for coming tonight. And like Lisa mentioned, this will be posted on our website and um, sooner or later on the um, INPS Facebook page. We're still, this is, all the stuff is hot off the presses. So we're trying to figure out how to do that. Um, can't tell you quite how to do that right yet, but um, uh, so thank you for coming tonight. And Roger, thank you very, very much for uh, um, sharing kind of a grim story, but at least I think we have more understanding um, and I think especially understanding of the importance of the biological soil crust. Well, great. Thanks. All right. Good night, everybody. Thanks so much.